Gigabyte Server Adventure Hour, yes. <laughs> We've got another project in the Gigabyte Server Corner. This time we're going to set up Proxmox and go through some projects and some gotchas. Got a guide in the level one forum. We've got actual work that we need to do with a real server. Let's take a look. So let's talk about one of the horrors, true horror shows, is device testing. So there's actually some devices missing here, but tablets, phones, you know, sometimes you write applications, sometimes you do stuff, you need to test actual applications. And so you might have a, uh, you know, an older Mac Pro that you've hacked to run things, running Xcode and it's connected and you've got some simulated devices down there, but then you've also got some real devices. And you've got the actual trash can Mac Pro running even more stuff. We're getting ready to relaunch the level one website. Oh, I think we are. If you're a programmer or anybody that does anything with computer science, doing development for the web or even mobile devices really is like one of the circles of hell. I'm sorry, but it is. And the reason for that is because a lot of the times you have customers that literally just don't understand anything. Like you can imagine a petulant child, like, you know, banging on the desk because they're not getting their Cheerios fast enough. I mean, a lot of the time that's, you know, what the executive team is like because they don't really understand nuance. And so when you build a website or you build an application, you can't really necessarily, it's not, a, it's not a valid expectation that you have control over every little thing down to the nth degree. So a lot of the time, one of the problems you can run into is that things will render a little differently on a bunch of different devices, uh, different versions of iOS, especially like people with iPhones and Apple devices, they tend to be especially demanding. Like their expectations just really don't line up with reality at all a good good portion of the time or they don't understand i mean you can try to rehab and you know help them understand but it's really key that you be able to spin up and run things through simulations so as you're doing development instead of manually testing on this and manually testing on real devices it's helpful to use a server to automate that first with virtualized devices or devices that are being simulated and then later with actual real devices that you're controlling remotely. Now it also looks kind of like a click farm. So like those click farms where there's just a, a wall of phones like that one over there that's like moving and clicking on stuff. Not really a lot different than the click farms that, that it sort of exist out there on the internet. Enter the Gigabyte G242 Z11. Oh, you can really hear it humming now. It's using its virtualized GPUs and virtual machines to run through a whole bunch of automated testing. I mean, that's the beauty of continuous integration and continuous development. Headless Chrome is one of the use cases. One of the foundational components for that is Proxmox. But imagine my surprise when I installed Proxmox out of the box and it didn't have things like Turbo Boost. Let's get away from this server into a little bit more quiet environment and I'll show you what I mean. Okay, so how do you get the most out of that Gigabyte server? Like, why even use that? I mean, it doesn't, it's, it's different than the other servers that we reviewed. It's a, it's a good balanced server. I've got room for GPUs, for GPU accelerated workloads, which is important. I can run VDI on it, mixed workload, VMs like that. So if I need PCIe resources, I've got four double height slots in a 2U space. It's pretty good. I've also got room for three and a half inch hard drives. In this case, we've got, you know, 16 to 24 terabytes of usable space with some relatively pedestrian eight terabyte WD red hard drives. This is great because when I'm running a simulation on a device, I can do a full device recording. So like if somebody has a device and it's problematic going through rotation, like you rotate it and then you rotate it back, does it still work? You'd be surprised how often it doesn't. So having a recording of that or producing a recording of that and saving that recording, that can chew up a fair bit of disk space even when you're using H.264, especially if you're doing archives. Every time a programmer sends something to the repository, save a recording. You never know when you'll need it to prove something later because the aforementioned Apple users. No, I'm just picking on Apple users, but seriously though, I mean, you know, if you develop for the web, chime in, tell me I'm wrong. Tell me I'm wrong in the comments. So having that horsepower, GPU horsepower, it's really nice. Then also we've got NVMe. So for things that I need to go really fast, like the database, we've got NVMe slots for that as well. Let's get two regular PCIe slots, 10 gig interface. So this is a perfect chassis for basically having a development sandbox that does a little bit of everything without being extreme maximum overkill. Now, if you need a little bit of everything, but two NVMe slots or four GPU slots is not enough. I've got another chassis coming. And uh, 
that one is going to be great for researching other planets to live on because things are getting kind of dicey here. But I digress. In order to be able to run those kind of mixed workloads, we need some kind of virtualization platform. And so I know I've done a lot of content and stuff like that on Proxmox and a lot of other channels and other content creators, like, you know, big shout out to Craft Computing. He's come a long way and he's doing so much. Home lab stuff, it's, it's really neat stuff. The problem is that um, if you just install Proxmox out of the box, it really has some defaults that I ran into that um, I would change. So, uh, in the guide on the level one forum, you know, I sort of assume that you'll have no problem installing Proxmox. And actually, it's ZFS installer, the Ubuntu team can actually take a, a lesson or two from this because its ZFS installer is quite good. It's pretty easy to set up ZFS on root with Proxmox. I had a relatively complicated disk setup, but it was super easy to set up that disk setup with ZFS directly in the Proxmox installer. So good job Proxmox team on that. And then from there, you've got a web GUI on port 8006 for configuring virtual machines and doing pretty much anything else that you'd want to do. So there's this idea of virtual machines. Those are full fat virtual machines. It's computers literally simulating another computer. It's got, there's kind of a lot of overhead with that, you know, on a system like this, as I've got it configured. Your Gigabyte server is rocking the uh, 24 core P series AMD Epic ROM CPU. I think that's a 7402P. Right now, I've got 64 gigs of memory in there, but probably by the time this video goes live, it's gonna be 128 gigabytes of memory across all eight channels. It's a very small motherboard, so you only get one DIMM per channel, maximum one terabyte in this chassis. If you wanna know more about the chassis, check out the review that I did on this gigabyte chassis previously. But as this is configured, it's a pretty darn kick butt development system for doing all this stuff. There's also LXC, Linux containers, and so this is a sort of a lightweight container thing. It doesn't rise to the level of something like Docker, which in addition to providing container services, also provides some orchestration and some automation functionality. It's not like Kubernetes or anything like that. It's just lightweight containers. And you can pack hundreds of Linux containers on a machine like this, whereas you might only be able to pack, you know, one to several dozen actual virtual machines on something like this before almost all of your performance goes to context switching for the different VMs. Now that's gonna vary a little bit depending on what the memory footprint and the CPU footprint is of each individual VM. But mixing, you know, using a container everywhere you can and a VM everywhere else that you can't generally pays off. Now, I mentioned Docker. This machine doesn't, you know, this Proxmox, this kind of thing, doesn't really do Docker out of the box. So we got ZFS, which I like for snapshots and everything else, and full fat virtual machines. So we can install all the virtual machines that we need all day. But containerization orchestration, not so much. Enter Docker. There's really three ways to install Docker on a Proxmox host like this. You can install it inside a virtual machine, it's nested basically, uh, inside a container, it's again nested but a little different nesting, and then just directly on the host. Now there are security implications for doing it in a container and doing it directly on the host. Doing it directly on the host is by far the least secure. Uh, it's not something that I would do on a Proxmox system that is serving things on the public internet. Maybe an internal server, development server in our scenario here, certainly I think that's okay. It's a larger conversation. I'd be happy to get into it with you on the level one forum. But for this video, just know that, you know, you're, you're cutting some corners here and you need to understand that there is some nuance in terms of like the security aspect and, and all the particulars of uh, you know, choosing to do what we're doing here because we're going off script with Proxmox and this is not something the Proxmox team would want to support if you do want to opt for that paid subscription. You can use Proxmox for free, it's kind of like VMware, but there are some paid extras that are definitely worth it if you're doing that. If you're just doing this for home lab or experimentation or whatever, then uh, maybe it's a different story. In the level one guide, there's also information on setting up Docker. That's when I noticed something. The performance really wasn't what it should be. That's when I found that the default kernel configuration on Proxmox did not enable Turbo Boost. Uh, there's some some old school, you know, white beard developers out there that think that turbo on a modern CPU is akin to overclocking. That's not true. That's super not true. They're literally designed to boost. So in the level one forum guide, it walks you through creating a systemd startup script that will re-enable boosting every time. There's also some packages that I highly recommend um, to do with setting the CPU frequency. And so I've written some step-by-step -step instructions for configuring that so that you can check your CPU frequencies. Because you know, out of the box, if you run those utilities, it says our 7402P Epic processor supports a maximum of 2.8 gigahertz. 
when in reality, it'll turbo to 3.35 gigahertz almost all day long on almost all cores, depends on what you're doing. But for this kind of a workload, man, those cores will run at 3.35 gigahertz. And that is a difference you can feel when you're at the database. That's a difference <laughs> that you can feel when you're moving a lot of files around. That's a difference you can feel when you're simulating you know, an iPhone or an Android device or running some kind of a connection or running a remote connection and doing screen capture, you can definitely feel that kind of a setup on this machine. It's definitely worth doing. So I've written a guide for doing that on a level one form as well. So, I, you know, I, I sort of started out talking about, you know, device simulation and virtual machines for development as a kind of use case here. This machine fits really well for that, but I'm sure that if you're a system administrator working in other industries or doing something like that, and you want a server that's got some hot swap bays, but also some capability of adding high speed devices like GPUs, also the Liquid Honey Badger. Oh, the Liquid Honey Badger's very nice, very fast, even beyond the NVMe capabilities here, because you've got 128 PCI Express lanes to work with after all. Then this chassis is definitely something that you should look at for these kinds of a use case. So I'm gonna be doing some other content on Proxmox probably if you have questions or anything else like that that you've run into with Proxmox or you're, you're looking at this and saying, hey, you're right. The out of the box defaults here maybe don't make a lot of sense. Let me know. Uh, maybe I did something wrong during the installer. Maybe there was a checkbox somewhere that, that, that will uh, you know sort of fix all this. I don't know, but I think that you need, when you install those packages that I was talking about, it adds another systemd service and you edit a file in, in your uh, et cetera folder to change the default uh, governor because on demand for what I do, you lose a little bit of a performance. Uh, you can use a little bit of performance using on demand instead of performance. Theoretically, on demand should work fine, but if you've got a workload that doesn't make the system super busy, uh, sometimes I find that the CPU will go to sleep a little bit and then it'll get busy and then it'll wake up and then it'll go to sleep and it'll wake up. So the system is loaded in just the right way. It's spending a lot of time, you know, going to sleep and waking up. I don't, I don't want a narcoleptic server. I want to actually have everything run in performance mode all the time and it's worth the extra 25 bucks a year in electricity. That's fine, but you know, depending on what you're doing, your home lab and some other parameters, uh, you may not be in the same boat. And the on-demand governor will probably improve with time because that sort of sleep-wake, sleep-wake uh, edge case is something that they're adding counters to look for. And in some scenarios, it's gotten a lot better than it did when the on-demand performance governor first showed up. But again, that's another conversation that get a little off track. And I just wanted to point to the guide in the level one forum for installing and configuring Proxmox on this hardware, but it really could apply to any hardware. It could apply to you know any kind of a home lab system that you're setting up. You could check right now. You could run those commands from the how-to on your existing Proxmox system and see if your CPU has got turbo boost because pretty much any CPU of the last eight years has some kind of turbo. And if you don't have it turned on, you're just leaving performance on the table. So hopefully that's helpful to you. Thanks Gigabyte for sending the server over. I'm Wendell, this is level one. I'm signing out and you'll find me in the level one forums.